So how exactly does a Windows Power user make the switch to Linux? As it turns out, it's not that hard, so let's talk about it. But first off, we're going to talk about why I was a Windows Power user, and more than likely why you are probably a Windows Power user as well. Windows has this one selling point. It actually has two selling points, but the biggest one is consistency. I started using Windows around the Windows 95 era, when people were starting to jump ship from DOS and Windows 3.1 into the new era of the taskbar and the start menu, and all of the things that we know and love about Windows today. And since then, it really hasn't changed. You know, they've gone from being DOS-based to being based off of the NT kernel. That was a big switch but it didn't affect us as end users all that much. And they've added new features to stay relevant. They've tweaked the UX, um, improved networking, all these different things, but at its core, Windows was still always the same, until Windows 8. In Windows 8, things started to switch up, and they were, they were okay, but really Windows 10 was the silver bullet that stabbed uh, Windows power users like myself in the heart. Bullets don't stab you in the heart, but you know what I'm saying. It really became unusable for me when updates were forced at random times, settings that you had configured previously got reset every time there was an update. That is unacceptable. Completely and utterly unacceptable. When Windows started ignoring the registry editor and the group policy editor, when things got buried further in submenus, and so you have to go into like seven different submenus in order to change one single network setting. There were hundreds of reasons why Windows became unusable, and I'd venture to guess that you watching this, you probably know about most of them, and that's why you're interested in this topic. So I'm not gonna dwell on that for too long, but Windows became unusable. We know it. So, What's the solution to this? Well, obviously the solution for me was to switch to Linux. But of course that's easier said than done. Right, for people like myself, who are Windows junkies, we are traditionally the hardest demographic to switch, to make that switch, to jump ship from one operating system to the other. Because we have repositories full of software that we've collected over the years that we still use, we don't want to find alternatives. Sometimes you can't find alternatives, and that's that seems like a big deal breaker. Not using the control panel, not knowing where everything is inside of the control panel on a new OS, or not being able to force quit things with a task manager. That seems pretty rough, you know, since you've been doing it your entire life. Whenever something freezes up, you always hit control shift escape, and you can force quit it just like that. It's that simple. Trying to relearn all of these things is a pain. Even for someone like me who, you know, I'm I'm always up for a new challenge when it comes to computing. I like learning about new technologies and whatnot. Don't always like employing these new technologies into my life, but I'm I'm curious about them, is what I'm saying. But it's jarring to make the switch. So the question is, why did I decide to make the switch? I could have just stuck with Windows for the foreseeable future, but I didn't. The first reason is, well, the first thing to note is I haven't abandoned it completely, right? And you don't have to abandon it completely. I still have a couple of Windows partitions. Some of my machines are dual booted and my main PC is now dual booted because I rely on iTunes for certain things and also Microsoft Office. There are alternatives to Microsoft Office, but especially for Excel, there are certain things those alternatives just don't do well, or at all in some cases, and so sometimes you have to use uh, Excel. And same thing with uh, PowerPoint and Word. There are certain times when you have to go back to those just to edit certain things that can't be done elsewhere. So I have the Windows partition for that, and for some other software too, like Google Earth, which doesn't really have an alternative in the Linux world yet, and other things that I'll encounter down the road that have to be installed on Windows, that are only supported on Windows. So I haven't abandoned it yet, but I have primarily switched over. 
One of the reasons why I primarily switched over was as a CS graduate, it was immensely helpful to learn the uh, Linux file system. It was very educational. And in fact, they'll make you take a course in college called Operating Systems. And it'll teach you about file descriptors and spin locks and concurrency and the shell versus the kernel. These are all things that are easier to learn about when you're using Linux because in Microsoft everything's sort of monolithic and hidden away from the user. So Linux makes it very accessible to yeah, do an octal dump of a file descriptor or something like that. So we actually had to use Linux for that particular course. The biggest reason though is that this will all prove easier in the long run. right? I could be sticking it out with Windows 7 for the foreseeable future. I could be using Windows 10 AME that I did a video on. I could be hacking Windows 8 with Classic Shell and using that. I mean, that's going to be supported till what, 2021 or something? There are lots of options that I have uh, for sticking with Windows. But the fact is, it's just going to be easier in the long run because there will come a point when we have to jump ship. Right? There's no way that things are going to get any better in the Windows world. With every update that Windows 10 receives, something else gets taken away. Something else becomes subscription only. More ads get pushed to more places. More spyware gets pushed to more places. It's just not getting any better. And this is, this is manifest destiny. This is status quo. This is the way that things are going to be. So the sooner that I could make the switch, I figured the better because this is going to happen eventually, it's inevitable. And I'm actually glad I did, because Linux makes things in my life easier. Programming is one area, but of course not everybody does programming. But in other areas it's easier as well, because customization is a lot more simplistic. Um, installation is a lot more simplistic. Whenever I reinstall an OS, I've written a script that installs all of my software without me having to do a single thing, and configures my desktop environment the way I want it to. Uh, all of my shortcuts, all of my settings, it just puts them right back in. And doing this in Windows wasn't uh, easy business, because you couldn't just script all of the uh, customization settings. You'd have to do a lot of them manually by going in to the control panel and setting certain things and also, when it comes to installing software, you would have to manually install all of the executable files. You know, copy all of the EXEs from a flash drive and install them one by one, instead of just having a script do it. And when it comes to copying over the customizations for all of those software packages, you could sometimes copy over the app data folder and have most of those settings follow the apps. But a lot of times there would be conflicts in doing so, and you have to spend hours sorting those out. Linux makes all of that a lot easier. You don't have to worry about things like that. Also, for those of us who came from DOS, I didn't. Um, but a lot of people back in the DOS days, once Windows started to, to come out, like Windows 1, Windows 2, Windows 3, and 3.1, the common complaint was that although the GUI was neat, it was a lot more buggy and slow, and it was just easier to get things done on the command line. And with Linux, it's sort of command line centric. You don't need to use the command line, but it will make your life a lot easier. You can get things done faster. And it's sort of like reliving the glory days that uh, I personally never got to experience. Really, I'd recommend doing that on Windows, too, if you're going to stick with Windows. Learn how to use PowerShell or the command prompt. It makes things easier uh, when something goes wrong for troubleshooting. But anyway, if you're wondering how you should get started, because you probably see the writing on the wall as well, you probably know that eventually you're going to have to make the switch. So here's my recommendation with how to get started first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to select a Debian-based distribution. If you don't know um, about the sort of spiderweb of Linux distributions, there are several parent distributions that have been around forever. One of the big ones is Debian, 
And next to Debian, you have things like Arch and OpenSUSE and a few others. But Debian is the one that Ubuntu has come out of, right? Everyone knows about Ubuntu. Ubuntu came from Debian, and Ubuntu is the one that is supported um, by the industry. In fact, if you have any Dell machine that was made in at least the past 15 years, it's probably Ubuntu certified. That new computer that I bought in 2016, that came with a sticker that says Ubuntu certified. And so, realistically, just about any Debian distribution will work just fine with a Dell computer. And uh, as support goes, Debian-based distros are supported the best across all the hardware that does support Linux. And most of the tutorials online that help you revolve around Debian commands, the Debian package manager, which is apt, and uh, doing things the Debian way. I started out, like I said, actually no, I didn't say it, did I? I downloaded Ubuntu for the first time in 2010, and back in 2010, that's what everybody recommended as the beginner's distro. These days, I would recommend Linux Mint. If you have a newer spec computer, get it with a cinnamon desktop. If your computer is a little more sluggish, you might consider um, either Mate or I think XFCE, was it XFCE or KDE? There are different desktop environments you can try out. Um, but the Cinnamon desktop is really the best in terms of the Windows workflow. It's, it's sort of like a Windows replacement intended for people who are used to Windows. So Linux Mint was my weapon of choice um, recently because back when I downloaded Ubuntu back in 2010, there was no way I was going to install that on my main machine. just didn't make much sense back then. Uh, for a variety of reasons, which I'm not going to get into right now. I actually started to make the switch back, uh, gosh, probably August of last year. That was it. August 2018, I started to make the switch. And I selected Linux Mint, as I said. But something else that you want to do, definitely, is you want to install it on bare metal. Now you can create a virtual machine at first just to see how things are and to take a look around. But don't try to do actual work on a virtual machine unless your computer is extremely powerful. Really in order to get the feel for Linux you need to work on bare metal. So these days most of us have an old beater computer that we have lying around somewhere. Take that computer, install Linux on it, and try spending a certain amount of time every day or every week you know spend a couple hours a week trying to get work done over there and increase this time as time goes on so instead of two hours a week go to four hours a week then to five hours a week increase your time on it and every time you have something that you don't know how to do on Linux try to learn it but you're learning it on a secondary computer, so there's no pressure, right? At any time, you can go back to your Windows install and get things done if you can't figure it out. But just tinker around and try to figure out how to do things on the secondary machine. And if you ease into it and you chip away at the learning curve one small step at a time, it won't be overwhelming and you won't get frustrated with it. And like I said before, um, one thing that you definitely want to do is you want to try to experiment around with the command line, with the terminal. That's what it's usually called on uh, Linux. We call it the terminal most of the time. Desktop environments change from distribution to distribution, right? The little menus that you use to configure settings are going to be different on every dis distribution. But the one thing that's mostly constant is the command line. Mostly. You know, if you switch from Debian to Arch or something, then there will be some differences. But by and large, the command line is universal, just like Windows was universal in the way it operated from 95 to 7. The control panel was the same. In, the, in that regard, the command line is the same from computer to computer. So if you can learn how to make use of it, even if it's just a little bit, then it'll make your life a lot easier and it'll feel like a much more seamless experience. Things that I would caution you not to do. Uh, one thing is distro hopping. 
a lot of people they'll hop from distribution to distribution just because they like the fact that they can do that but that's kind of counterproductive you waste a lot of time doing that it's okay to do that once in a while um, to download different distributions install them in a VM and see what they have to offer but when it comes to actually learning Linux you want to take that secondary computer keep that distro on it and don't keep reinstalling because you're just going to be backtracking every time you do that hopefully you found this helpful if uh, if it's your intention to experiment around with Linux or possibly make the switch. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them below. And as always, stay fantastic.